Well, good afternoon and a warm welcome on behalf of Leeds Lit Fest 2022 and on behalf of Millen to our conversation today in the company of the lawyer and author Barrington Black. On behalf of Millen and Leeds Lit Fest, we really appreciate your time and support in joining us. My name is Jonathan Strait. Before I introduce this event, I'd like to say just a few words on behalf of the nine Leeds Lit Fest partners. At this time, it's never been more complicated to deliver a, a literature festival, but in our view, never more important for the festival to happen. To make the festival as accessible as possible, we're offering a mixture of online and in-person events and a few hybrid events like this one. We realise that these are not easy times uh, for anyone, but it will be much appreciated if you could make a donation to the festival to ensure that we can return next year. Details of how to donate uh, will be in the chat and also at leadslipfest.co.uk. So welcome to you, our audience here uh, in the beautiful and historic setting of the Leeds Library. And welcome to those of you watching at home in Leeds, around the UK and indeed around the world. Your questions are very welcome. Uh, for those of you at home, please use the Q&A facility on your screen and type in whatever you'd like to ask. Uh, our live audience can, of course, ask questions in the usual manner. And as ever, we will try our very best to get through as many of your questions as we can. Again, for those of you watching at home, can I draw your attention to the chat facility on your screens? This can be used to send a message or comment to the other participants on this webinar, should you wish to do so. And finally, this event is being recorded. It will appear on our website at millim.org.uk in the next few days. There you can find recordings of other past events, as well as details of our future programme for which you can book tickets, uh, as well as a link to some other Leeds LitFest events. Can I also uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, Leeds LitFest partner Truman Books uh, for providing books on sale here at the Leeds Library and indeed uh, should you wish to purchase uh, Barrington Black's excellent book after the talk, uh, th there are copies available and I'm sure uh, he will be happy to, uh, to sign, them, uh, sign them for you. So, to our guest, uh, Barrington Black became one of the UK's best known criminal solicitors and is founder of the Leeds practice now known as Black's, I'm sure well known to many in our audience today. He went on to serve as a Metropolitan Stipendary Magistrate and then as a Circuit Judge before rounding off his career as a Supreme Court Justice in Gibraltar. Barrington has appeared in many high profile cases, including representing Donald Nielsen, known as the Black Panther, on the charge of murder and kidnapping. His letters regularly feature in The Times, The Telegraph and The Jewish Chronicle and he has contributed as a legal expert to local television uh, news stations here in Yorkshire. Now based in North London, Barrington Black was a longtime resident of Harrogate where he was a local councillor and parliamentary candidate. His autobiography, Both Sides of the Bench, was published in 2015. He's recently published this book, The Jewish Contribution to English Law, which we will now uh, discuss. Barry to Black, a very warm welcome to you on behalf of Leeds, Litfest and Millen. What was it that made you write this book? I'll tell you, it, it, it was the, um, the, the pandemic, it was uh, COVID, it was being locked down. Um, despite being uh, married for 60 years to the same person, uh, I, I took uh, being uh, locked down as uh, rather an onerous situation. Uh, and what in fact happened was, it happened to most of you, first few days, what can we do? We clear out the cupboards and the drawers and the bookshelves. Cupboards and drawers are one thing, but bookshelves are another. When I started to clear the bookshelves, I started to have a look at the books and I had quite a collection of books on Jewish history, legal history. Uh, and I, I sat down and rather than clear them out and throw them out, I found myself reading them. And there were two particular aspects of the book which uh, that I found uh, that precipitated my, my writing the instant book. Now, as is evident from your book, Jewish people are, are prominent in the legal profession. Do you think there's a particular reason why that might be? Uh, there's a very, very evident reason. Um, look at the Bible. We, we are described several times as a, as a stiff-necked people. 
uh, an obstinate people, an argumentative people. Uh, Cain and Abel didn't do terribly well, did they, uh, when it came to uh, arguments. Uh, we readily ar argue with ourselves, uh, with um, the, the rabbi, and the whole way of learning the Torah and getting it into our minds is by arguing, doubting, questioning, looking at alternatives uh, in, in, within the Bible, of course, uh, and we argue naturally. And, and so it came that there were problems for the Jewish people, the pogroms, the massacres, and we naturally had to look to ways of defending ourselves. And we had to look to ways of examining the law, and we had to look to ways of carrying on our existence. Uh, and we found that we were fairly vocal, that we were fairly uh, able to argue. People turned to us, uh, as, as the book says, uh, kings and queens turned to uh, Jews for advice and for help. Uh, and uh, we found that we were naturally addicted to, to the law. And happily, by the very fact that people came along to us and sought our advice and help, uh, we were reasonably successful in that direction. Thank you. Now, the issue of who is a Jew is a, is a complex one. So how did you address that in terms of who you were including in, in your book? That's an, an interesting question. I mean, let's start off with where do we come from? We, we, we come from Abram, don't we? We come from Abram who, within the fertile crescent, lived in a place called Ur, uh, on the banks of the Euphrates. Uh, and he and his flock were manhandled down towards Egypt, didn't have a terribly good time there and were persuaded to go out of Egypt. Uh, and we went through the ages of King Solomon, King David. We eventually had problems, of course, with the Romans, uh, and they desecrated the temple, and we fled. We fled along the north coast uh, of Africa. We reached uh, Spain and Portugal. Many went in the other direction. They went east towards Baghdad, uh, and in that area to India and on to China. And they, they moved all over the world, but particularly those who, in fact, came along the north coast of Africa, hit Spain and Portugal, were thrown out of Spain and Portugal, went back to Africa, then went back into Spain and Portugal, up there through France, into Germany, into Holland, to Poland, spread all over the world. Now, defining what is a Jew, halakhically, by the Torah, if your mother is Jewish, then halakhically you are a Jew. Uh, your father doesn't have to be. It would be ideal if he was, but he doesn't have to be. Uh, and the situation is that many people whom I've mentioned in my book uh, are people who accept that they are halakhically Jewish, but there are also people who may not be terribly keen on being uh, described as Jewish. Uh, and they have, I won't say fallen by the way, but they have fallen away from some of the practices and procedures although they have maintained the name. Uh, let me give you an example. Dominic Raab was the uh, first person, Jewish origin, to uh, become a, a Lord Chancellor. There's been a long uh, and um, a complicated argument as to whether a Jew could ever be appointed Lord Chancellor due to religious reasons. Uh, Dominic Raab was appointed Lord Chancellor. Uh, he uh, had a Jewish father. His mother was not Jewish. so. Halakhically, is not in fact Jewish. Although, to his credit, if there are ever matters involving anti Semitism or, or, or problems of similar nature, he will always stand up and be counted, and he will count himself uh, as being somebody of Jewish origin. And there are many judges, uh, senior judges, who are in a similar situation. Let me give you one little example, which I, I, I rather like. Uh, I served for a period in the army, uh, and therefore I attend the Association of Jewish Ex-Servicemen, ex a, a commemorative parade in Whitehall each year. And the general commanding who took the parade a couple of years ago was Major General Nuge, N-U-G-G-E-E. -E. And at the reception afterwards, Major General Nuge, who had been invited because he was officer commanding a, a very large area, not because of any faults of his background, he confided. Uh, that in fact his, um, his grandfather uh, was in fact Jewish, uh, and his father in fact was Jewish. Uh, now that in fact meant that uh, Mr. Justice Nugent, his uh, brother, uh, would be in a similar situation. And Mr. Justice Nugent's wife uh, is uh, 
Hello, who? Who? Emily Thornbury. Emily Thornbury, the uh, uh, shadow uh, 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 foreign minister. Now, they may not accept and do not accept, of course, that they are Jewish. They are, they are Christian and they are conservative Christian. But Major General Nuji became so idealistic about his background that he joined the Association of Jewish Ex Servicemen and is a patron and, and happily attends many of our functions. And so that can happen to people. People can either shy away from their Jewishness or, or, or they can grasp it at the first opportunity. Uh, one example of somebody always assumed to be Jewish, Benjamin Disraeli. Yes, born of a Jewish mother, born of a Jewish father, but when he was very young, his parents decided that they would become baptized, that they would not pursue any form or form of Judaism. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, he was always looked upon as Queen Victoria's favorite Jew. Uh, there it is, you can't get away from it, can you? <laughs> Now, the, the subtitle of your book is Through 1858 to Modern Times. So clearly something happened in 1858, and we'll get to that hopefully in a moment. But before that time, you describe various laws applying to the Jews who were living uh, here in, in England. What was the situation uh, for Jews legally before 1858? Well, let's go, let's go way back in time. Uh, most people uh, assume the Jews came over with William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror came from Rouen in France in 1066, and there were um, quite a few Jews there who were involved in commerce, uh, and uh, he made quite a lot of use of them. When he conquered England and came over here and set up his outfit here, he, he realized that one thing was missing, and that was people who had some knowledge of commerce, and so he brought them over, uh, and quite a few, few hundred came over at that time. Now, as I say, they were assumed to be the first Jews here. But I question that. I would rather go back to the time of uh, the Roman uh, entry to England, where we go back to, what is it, uh, the years uh, uh, 46 uh, uh, through to two, two or 300. The, the Romans, remember, occupied a great swathe of the Mediterranean. And in that great swathe of the Mediterranean, which they occupied, um, having done what they did to Jerusalem, there were between three and five million Jews living in Roman times. The Romans were quite good to the Jews, apart from messing around at Masada uh, with the, the Maccabeans, uh, and apart from messing up uh, the, the temple, people were allowed to practice their religion in Roman times. And um, of course, if the Romans occupied uh, a large area of the Mediterranean, it would be natural for some Jews to have been pulled into his army. Uh, maybe not full legionnaires, but as part and parcel of the army. And there are those who have little bits of evidence, not terribly good evidence, that there were Jews in, in the Roman army who came to Britain. But it, it, goes, um, it goes a little further than that. But between the time of the Romans and the uh, 1066 arrival uh, of William the Conch, uh, in about 700, the year 700, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Egbert, and I'm sorry, the Archbishop of York, Egbert, and the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, I don't remember his name, but Archbishops round about the year 700, each issued a decree. And the decree of Egbert was that Christians should not join Jews for their feasts. And the advice given by the other Archbishop was that there should be no intercourse between Christian women and Jewish men. Now, if in fact those particular edicts were issued at that time, it stands to reason that there must have been some Jews around, somewhere or other, for that precaution to have been uh, evoked by the archbishops. So we come to William the Conqueror, the general time. In the 13th century, there were several edicts laws relating to the Jews. There were about six or seven, there were probably 25 altogether, but there were six or seven favorite ones or known ones uh, brought about by Henry I, Henry II, and Edward III. Uh, there was the, the law of the Jew, the jury, indicating that, oops, that they would have to wear a badge over their heart. 
And that badge was not the Star of David that uh, the Nazis uh, wrote about. The, bar, the, the badge that they had to wear were two tablets, the two tablets of the law. And even now, when you see clergymen and barristers wearing tabs, those white tabs, they are really tabs short for tablets, the elements of the law there. So, as I say, there were all these laws that were brought in by the various kings. Now, why were they brought in? Well, initially, because the Jews were doing quite well. When they came over with William the Conch and they got involved in commerce, then they had an advantage. Christians could not, because of the edict of the church, charge interest. But the Jew could. And the Jew was doing that. And he was providing money for the, uh, the abbeys, for the palaces, for the armies, uh, and uh, it, it was quite a successful business. So the various kings said, hey, 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 on, we've got to rein this in a little bit. And one of the laws that they indicated that they brought was to stop the usury, to stop the interest, to reduce it. And of course, they were damning themselves because they were taking advantage of being loaned money for the reasons which I've just indicated. But other laws that were brought in during the 13th century, for example, uh, Jews had to live in certain places. They could, uh, they, they could only live in certain cities. And there's a wonderful map in, in a book by Sir Martin Gilbert, which indicates the places where Jews, in fact, were living in the 1300s, would you believe? Not just North London, not just Manchester, not just Liverpool, not just some of the well-known places, but in 80 different places throughout England. And it is evidenced by the fact that there were documentation kept by the local authority at that time under the order of the king to indicate the sort of business that Jews were doing. And they had to be registered in this, in this particular document. And all these towns have those indications which are given. Now, of course, the mobs who in fact inflicted injury upon certain areas of where the Jews were living, uh, felt that they had an advantage. If they went into a Jew's house and they wrecked it, they might find some papers or documents relating to debts that uh, Christian people owed the Jews and they could destroy them and thus get rid of the debt. That worked one way, but from the point of view of the king, it wasn't very good because it meant he had no evidence if they were destroyed, he had no evidence to tax the Jews. And therefore, it was the king who insisted that an exchequer of the Jews be set up in his finance, in his treasury, to indicate each and every transaction committed by the Jew, so that he had a copy of it, and so that he could then tax them on it. And so on it went throughout that period of time until we reached the time of the expulsion. And the expulsion, uh, which, uh, meant that Jews had to uh, leave the country uh, was a very civilized expulsion. Civilized in that the king at the time of the expulsion indicated three ports that they had to use. He indicated that they had to be assisted in getting there. They shouldn't be hampered or, or hindered in any way. And he indicated they could take their luggage with them if they wanted to. Now, there can't be a more civilized expulsion than that. And so the expulsion, which lasted 300 years um, uh, 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 um, um, until uh, uh, 16, 1650 or so, uh, when Manasseh in Israel, a rabbi in Antwerp, came along to Oliver Cromwell and said, please, can the Jews come back? We, we, we can do quite a lot for you. Indeed, during the 300 years of the expulsion, there were Jews in England. There were about 100 conversios people who had converted to Christianity, but they still practiced their Judaism in secret. They observed the Passover, they observed Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Uh, the, 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 queen, the kings and queens liked to have the Jews around, uh, particularly for their medicinal talents. Uh, and uh, one particular uh, chap, Lopez, was brought over from uh, Portugal. Uh, he was a very clever doctor. Uh, by uh, Henry VIII to help him and to look after him. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth I had, had a, a Jewish doctor brought over to help her. 
one of them unfortunately got into bother because um, he was treating somebody uh, who was part of the royal family uh, and they didn't do terribly well and so he was punished well that is if you call being hung drawn and caught in punishment that's what happened to him but in the main the doctors were successful and why did the christian people like the jewish doctors because in those days medicine used hebrew and arabic and the jews were familiar with those two languages and so they could find out what was the latest what was the newest what was the best form of cure for the people who were ill at that time and so on it went I'm, I, I, I'm sort of running on on this question right. but it runs into the next point really because when they came back after the return they did they did quite well but there weren't very many of them just a few thousand and the ones who did remarkably well were people who were later to be known as the cousinhood, the uh, Montefiores, the Rothschilds, the Mokatas, the Cohens. Uh, they, 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 gained, uh, they gained popularity with the powers that be. They gained popularity with the prime minister. They did remarkably well. They were ambitious. And what does an ambitious Jewish mother want? She wants her son to be able to get a good education. She wants him to go into a profession. Uh, she wants him to go to Cambridge or Oxford if possible. But could he go to Cambridge or Oxford? He could go there, but he wouldn't get a degree. Why wouldn't he get a degree? Because he had to swear an oath. And the oath was the oath on the true faith of a Christian. And because he didn't have a degree, he couldn't qualify as a barrister. And if he couldn't qualify as a barrister, he couldn't become a judge. And uh, that was the ultimate aim of every Jewish mother, that her son should uh, become a judge and reach the top, and maybe, who knows, even become a lord. And so it was the mother of Lionel Nathan de Rothschild, who would have been a very proud mother if, in fact, her son could become a member of Parliament, but he couldn't. On four occasions, he won a seat in Parliament. On four occasions he went to take up the seat. On four occasions he was not able to take the seat because he wouldn't take the oath of a Christian. So what happened? Around about the same time, another popular man called David Salomon uh, did very well in the city, helped with the formation of the National Westminster Bank, in fact, was very well thought of. And they said, hey, David, we'd like to make you sheriff. David said, well, I'd love to, but I can't take the oath. So they brought in what was known as the Sheriff's Declaration Oath, which enabled David Solomon to become Sheriff of London and use his own Bible. Hey, if he can do that to become Sheriff of London, and look around the corner, the Catholics have managed to get around it in 1829 by the uh, act which enabled Catholics to take office, which hitherto they'd not been able to. If they can all do it, why don't we get a special Jewish Relief Act, which would enable Lionel Nathan de Rothschild to take the oath and become a member of parliament. And that is what in fact they tried to do. For over a period of some 30 years, they tried to get a Jewish Relief Act passed, which would enable Mr. Rothschild, oh no, Baron Rothschild. He wasn't a baron here, but he was a baron in Europe. He was a Freiherr. His family were all Freiherrs, free men, which is the same as a baron. So if in fact he was able to take the oath, he could take up his seat. And so this act, the Jewish Relief Act, which would enable the Jew to use his own Bible, went to Parliament. For a period of over 20 years, it toed and froed and froed and toed. The Commons passed it, the Lords sent it back. Another time they passed it, the Lord sent it back. And believe you me, if you look at Hansard, shall we say in 1833, at some of the debates about the Jews Relief Act, you would think that the anti-Semitism that was complained of by members of the Labour Party uh, three or four years ago here was absolutely child's play. It was absolutely nothing. I read some of those debates and they're fascinating. <laughs> A gentleman would stand up in the House of Commons and he would say, oh, do you really consider dining at the table with a Jew? 
And the guy on the other side would say, yes, I would, because their cookery is not the worst part of the Jew. And, and, and so it went, so it went, until eventually the act was passed. Rothschild was able to take his seat. And the problem was, once he took his seat, he hardly ever made a speech. But there, there, there it was, he, he was through. Now, that Jewish Relief Act, which enabled somebody to go into Parliament, had an exception. And the exception was for the law. It would not entitle him to become a barrister, and it would not entitle him, therefore, to become a judge. So a few years later, about six years later, they did pass an act which enabled people to go to the law and practice the law and thus become uh, members of the judiciary. And uh, the first few managed to do it by a circuitous route. And the circuitous route was this. I've already told you, in order to get a degree at Cambridge or Oxford or even Durham, they had to take the oath that I've mentioned. Uh, one or two of them decided to make a contribution to uh, University College London. Now, I can see a few smiles because some of you will know that University College London was not as religiously minded as Cambridge and Oxford. University College London was in fact known uh, as the godless tower of Gower Street. Uh, uh, it had that reputation. And so they got their degrees there and that enabled them to go to the bar and that enabled them therefore to be uh, admitted to, 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 to the bench. Uh, as so, so, well, tell us about some of these early, uh, early. I mean, who, who, who was the first Jewish lawyer? Uh, well, the, the first, the first one was Francis Goldsmith of the Goldsmith family, uh, but he got there heaven knows how because he, in fact, uh, uh, got there more by aggravation uh, than, than, than by uh, the the legal route. Uh, his family were obviously well known. He was well known and they decided to let him through the net, and they let him through the net. Uh, following Goldsmith, there was, I think the next notable one was, was, was George Jessel. And George Jessel became a, a, a judge, and he became a judge through the proper route, through waiting for the act to be passed and, and uh, 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 obtaining the, uh, the appointment. But probably the best known of the early ones was uh, undoubtedly Rufus Isaacs. Rufus Isaacs was what in Jewish they call a lobus, uh, a, a, a devil may care individual, uh, a, a disappointment at school. I refer to his being at school, he was a lobus and he did not manage to pass any examinations at school. I see some of my grandchildren are here today and uh, knowledgeable nods from them. Uh, but it doesn't apply to them at all. I would dream of reply of describing them as a, as a lobbyist. Uh, but but, but, but um, he was, he was, Rufus Isaac was. So there was no question of, of, of him going on to uh, uh, university. Now he's fortunate because his father was a, a fruiterer. He had a, a, a fruit store and he said, you, you'll come in to do that. And uh, Isaac said, I would rather go to sea than do that. And his father being a fruiterer, of course, imported quite a lot of fruit from far away, from far climes. He said, right lad, if you want to go to sea, I'll arrange it for you. And he drove him down in this his horse and pair or whatever it was they used in those days, down to the uh, coast and signed him up. And one of the ships that in fact went to uh, India, to South America, as a cabin boy and off he went as a cabin boy 10 shillings a week a one-year contract to india every jewish mother's dream of something that she wanted to happen to her son happened to young uh, the, the young man he got to india fell off the boat hated it it was awful and so his father said well if you want to come back you i'm not going to pay for you to come back you've got to come back your own way and he managed to find his own way back to, to England. And he said, I, I was really sorry about that, that, that little ex expedition, uh, going into India on the back boat as a cabin boy. Awful, awful, awful. I, I, I will work hard. So they said, what do you want to do? And he said, well, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to become a stockbroker. What? And 
off, they sent him to work for a stockbroker, but he got hammered uh, after six months. He went skint again. Eventually, he came back and eventually he studied. He got down to it and he became pretty successful. And he became so successful, in fact, that he became Solicitor General, he became uh, 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 Chief Justice eventually, uh, and he also became the Viceroy of India. Now, uh, going back 40 years after, as Viceroy of India was a very different kettle of fish to going there as a cabin boy on that particular ship when he had gone there the first time. And he was a very successful Lord Chief Justice. It took quite a few years for there to be some further Lord Chief Justice, which you may possibly ask me about, which I'll deal with in a moment. So you continue to explain the history of, of Jews in the law, and we enter the 20th century, and you describe uh, 50 or so individuals who you term pioneers of the legal profession. Do, do any of these stand out for you? Are there any you'd like to mention? Well, the, 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 the ones in particular, I mean, a few years ago, we had three Lord, Lords Chief Justice on, on the trot. We had, we had Nicholas Phillips, um, who, who was a, a, a great judge. Um, uh, and then we, we, we had Peter Taylor, who practiced uh, in, in uh, the Northeast. Uh, and uh, after Peter Taylor, we had Harry Wolfe. And I must just tell you a little story about Peter Taylor, because I knew him pretty well. Peter Taylor was a magnificent pianist. He had a lot to do with the piano festival. He, uh, he was also a great rugby player. He, uh, he could have played, well, he played for his county. Uh, he, but he was a very, very, very good lawyer. And he was a very, very good judge, and he was a very good Lord Chief Justice. And I, I went to Peter Taylor's memorial service at St Paul's Cathedral. The clergy there, being St Paul's Cathedral, were the local church, uh, clergy, clergy. But also, in addition to that, uh, uh, there was a, a reform rabbi. But the whole thing was on a very reform basis. St. Paul's Cathedral was absolutely packed, eight or 900 people. And then through the service, up stood a young man, and it was Peter Taylor's son. And he put his hat, we, we used to call them a yarmulke. They, they then became known as kippah or kippal. They are the round um, hat that is worn. Uh, and uh, he put it on. And he said the prayer, the Jewish prayer, for somebody who's died, Yiskadal for Yiskadash. Now, in St. Paul's Cathedral, I looked around, and of the eight or nine hundred people there, I saw about four hundred of them put their hands in their pockets, me included, and put on a kippah, and we all joined in Yiskadal Yiskadash. That was a big moving moment. Uh, that was Peter Taylor. Uh, Harry Wolf, Harry. Um, Harry, a great judge, uh, still around in the House of Lords, a uh, very great guy. But there were other characters. I mean, you didn't have to be top great judges to be a character. Ewan Montague, the man who never was, the man who cooked up the idea of the, the body on the beach, uh, a, a, equipped with paperwork to show where the Allies were going to land, which was totally false, of course. Uh, and uh, through the Nazis completely off the real scent. Uh, it, it's been filmed so many times as, as that particular story. And there have been the characters, there have been there all sorts of characters uh, on, on the bench. Uh, and I, I believe the country is, is the better for them. Now, of these 50 individuals, these pioneers of the 20th century, very few are women. Now, maybe there are more than we would expect or less, I'm not sure, but there are still relatively few. And the other observation is how many of them uh, are Oxbridge graduates, a, a, a significant proportion. So maybe you could comment on, on those, two, those two issues. Yes, I'll go with the first one first. Of course, one of the foremost ladies, uh, well, uh, when I was a judge, uh, I was posted to, to uh, Harrow, uh, Harrow Crown Court, and the, 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 the judge there was a, a lady called Mirella Cohen, 
Now, Marilla Cohen uh, came from the Northeast. She'd been in the same chambers, actually, as, as, as Peter Taylor and Harry Wolf up there. Uh, and, and she was a typical Jewish grandmother. And she, she, she ruled the court like a, a grandmother. And if anybody sort of uh, misbehaved or did the wrong thing, I, I remember once somebody who knew a bit about it, she was quite an Orthodox lady, and they, they came into court uh, wearing the, a prayer shawl uh, and the, the, the phylacteries, the, the phylacteries which are Orthodox, well, which all Jews should wear, uh, which are bound by, by um, a leather strap, and, and which in fact contain uh, very, very important Jewish prayers. And she, this guy came into court with, with, with wearing these, and she said, what on earth are you doing dressed like that? That's how you dress when you get a synagogue. Don't you dare come into my court dressed like that. And then and she saw him off. The other one who springs to mind, of course, is, is uh, a, a, a woman who was the, 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 the heartbeat of every Jewish lawyer at the time, Rose Heilbrunn. Rose Heilbrunn was one of the first, uh, the first QCs, one of the first judges, um, she, she was an absolutely brilliant advocate, and she was a very well-loved uh, judge as well, uh, and everybody thought very highly of her. And now you ask well, why there are not so many. Uh, they are increasing. <laughs> they, are, they are getting more. There are quite a lot. Uh, and what is also interesting, of course, is the Asian uh, uh, practitioners. When, when, when I was young, there were just the odd one or two uh, but they've grown and grown and grown, and particularly the Asian ladies, they are very competent, and there are a few Asian ladies who are in fact uh, are, are on the bench at the moment, and they're very, very well thought of. And on, on that particular point, of course, uh, being here in Leeds, uh, there was a lovely barrister who practiced in Leeds called Alter Hurwitz. Alter Hurwitz was the son of a rabbi. Alter Hurwitz was an orthodox practicing Jew. And she was, he was proud of that. And when he found that it was difficult to obtain a tenancy to get into in, in to, to practice anywhere, what, what he did was he set up his own, his own chambers. And he made sure that in his own chambers, uh, there would not only be Jewish tenants, but there would be, and I can think of one particular guy called Peter Das, an Indian fellow, uh, uh, of quite high stature actually, but he was one of the first ones in practice. Uh, and he in fact established his chambers uh, with that particular idea. Otto Hurwitz was so orthodox that he would conduct a case, it is very, very good. He would conduct a case in the courts at the town hall here. And if the case went on to a Friday, and if on Friday it was the Sabbath, he would put down his pen he would continue conducting the case without making a note. And then he would walk home from the town hall to, I think it was Chapel Town where he lived at the time, uh, uh, and then on to, to Chapel Allerton, uh, where he later moved. He was a wonderful, a wonderful fellow. And his son, Vivian Hurwitz, uh, was, was also a, a, a reporter and then a, then a judge. Uh, and uh, he was a very good example. Yeah, I think many, many of us in Leeds have fond memories of, uh, of Vivian Hurwitz. He was certainly yeah. a, a great character. Now, your, your book um, then goes on to talk about notable Jewish solicitors, and Leeds is particularly well represented on that list. So, so who is worthy of who is worthy of? I'm going to mention one, and um, 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 he was a man, a wonderful man called Jack Levy. Now, uh, Jack Levy was was very well known. He was a wonderful criminal practitioner. He looked like, I don't know whether any of you remember, uh, uh, Billy Cotton Jr. He was a, a, a rather a, a, a rotund conductor. And that was, that was, that was uh, Jack. <laughs> Jack knew the law. He knew his bench. He knew his clients. They loved him. And when I came to practice criminal law in, in, in Leeds, uh, I, I used to say, uh, Jack Levy only happens once in a lifetime. <laughs> Why on earth did it have to be mine? <laughs> Jack was, was, was wonderful. I thought, I, I thought an awful lot about him. And uh, I could tell stories, but I better not tell too many stories about him. But there were also several individual solicitors who had served in the army and who then came out of the army and set up their practice. Uh, Charles Clayton, I can think of, for example. Sam Safman, 
who uh, set up a, quite a large practice here, quite a lot of them, people who couldn't get into other practices had a problem. I won't say why, but because they would not be accepted in other places for certain reasons, opened up their own practice uh, and did remarkably well. But uh, one of the, the greatest names in, in London, he's known remarkably well, is uh, Stanley Berwin. Uh, Stanley Berwin uh, was one of the first people who uh, managed to get articles at Booth and Co, I think it was. Uh, and then he set three different practices in London. Berwin Layton, S.J. Berwin, Stanley Berwin, and, and, and they all were extremely successful. So Leeds did provide quite a lot of Jewish uh, lawyers. But this uh, part of the book describes in great detail two particular individuals. One is uh, Lord Arnold Goodman and the other is Lord David Young. So what is it about those two that um, you, you, you felt merited su such particular attention? Goodman was a big guy. Uh, I, 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 he, he was known as, 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 as Two Dinners. And he was called uh, Two Dinners because he once arrived at a dinner party uh, and said, I'm uh, sorry that I'm late, but I, 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 I sort of uh, doubled my, uh, my, 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 uh, uh, my, my, my commitments and I've already been to so many uh, I mean, I, I had dinner there already. <laughs> and so the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, hostess said, oh, well, then you won't want any more. I said, no, 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 no. well, I'll, I'll try some more. He's a big guy who had bulk, but his bulk was mandated by his brain. He had a big brain. When he was in the army, he was uh, fortunate enough to meet uh, an MP called Wick. Uh, uh, I can't remember the first name. George. George. Yes, yes, Wick. Uh, who introduced him to quite a few of, of the of the Labour uh, uh, political people at that time, and he's introduced to them all, and he in fact uh, helped them, and he was brought in. Uh, and he was uh, brought in when they had problems. And the book, the autobiography that he wrote was, tell them I'm on my way. They'd ring him up and then he would help them. Uh, the other name you mentioned was, was Young. Did you mention David it? Young. David yeah. Young, you see. David Young was uh, on the other side, in, on, on the conservative uh, uh, side. David Young, in, in fact, was uh, fortunate enough to meet Margaret Thatcher quite quite early, and he was very much interested in the situation relating to uh, uh, East, uh, uh, European uh, politics in the EU, uh, and, and he was then introduced to quite a few other people, uh, political. Match uh, Thatcher, Ma Margaret Thatcher, when she was made prime minister, she in fact introduced him. Uh, she brought him into the uh, cabinet and uh, he served in the cabinet for quite a while, particularly with, with employment uh, and uh, looking after young people, providing for them ways of learning. And he also, by the way, became very much involved in ORT, o -R -T, uh, which is an organization which also looks after young people and introduces them uh, to all sorts of work. Now, what happened was the uh, Margaret Thatcher used to be very proud of him and very happy about him, very happy about the fact that she'd introduced him to the cabinet. And she used to say this, she used to say, everybody comes with problems to me, but George, uh, that, that David, always has the answers. He, he helps with the answers that people may have. And she thought very highly of him. And even up to, he was 90 last weekend, actually. I know him very well. He was, he was 90 last weekend. But until about uh, seven or eight years ago, he still had a room in number 10 Downing Street. Uh, and, and he uh, was looked after by Cameron uh, and uh, the uh, people who were there, notwithstanding his age, they still thought that he was very, very capable of setting up uh, uh, units there. A very, uh, very interesting uh, fellow. Now, uh, I wonder if we should take a, a question or two. If you're at home, um, you can type your question into the Q&A and we will uh, we'll do our best to ask them. Uh, but do we have any questions from our audience here for Barrington Black? Sir. 
Well, first of all, uh, I'm glad you, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, being in a library, I've always loved library, and I mean, in, in my earlier years, I used to spend lots of time in the sheepskirt library because it was quiet in the evening, and I could go upstairs and work in the, the, J, the, the uh, Joseph Corton, Joseph Porton room there. I also worked an awful lot in the reference library, which was next to the town hall. When I started to work in the reference library, there were two people who always worked at the same desk with me. One was a young lad called Alan Bennett. I don't know whatever happened to him. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you in a moment what happened to him. Um, and the other was Gerald Kaufman, Gerald Kaufman, but we used to work there as well. And also in the evening, um, a character, not well, wasn't the evening, it was in the late afternoon when the pubs closed, uh, a character used to come along and sit there reeking of beer, and that was Cremer, uh, 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 Cremer, uh, the, the, uh, the artist, the, 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 the guy, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob Cremer. Um, I used to work in, in, the, in the reference library. I originally was going to become a dentist because two members of my family, two great uncles, Three great uncles were the successful members in my family, and they were all, uh, as I say, very successful dentists. And I was going to go into the section of, uh, of the uh, sixth form of science and then go and become a dentist all day well. One day I came along to the radio, to the uh, library, and I saw the stag, the, the, the flag was, was flying outside. Uh, the town hall. And I said, why is the flag flying? They said, because the assizes are on. And just like you used to say, I said, well, can I go in and have a look? And they said, yes, there's a student's gallery you could go in and watch. And I went into the gallery and I sat there all afternoon. And that was before the days of Harry Ocknell and Gilbert Gray. That was in the days of a wonderful barrister uh, called Ogden Swift. Uh, Ogden Swift was a real stage type dramatic barrister, uh, just just like the ones that you see on television these days, with a, with a big big silver uh, curfew which he'd flash around uh, when he couldn't think of what to say. But that set me on. Uh, and when I went back to the library in the afternoon, having spent a day with uh, the uh, sizes, I said, "I'm going to change. I'm, I'm going to go for law." Now, you mentioned Gilbert Gray and you mentioned Harry Ogmore. Gilbert Gray was a great friend of mine. Gilbert, we were at university together. I instructed him an awful lot when he was a barrister. I instructed him an awful lot as a QC. And he did a lot of, of um, murder cases for me. And Gilbert was, was wonderful. He was a wonderful advocate. Now, Gilbert had a, a, a great talent and it was he wouldn't spend a lot of time reading the papers. He wasn't very good at dealing with fraud or complicated matters, but he was a great, a great jury barrister. Uh, he could, by his language, by his performance, he, he was theatrical, he was wonderful. And with many cases involving uh, uh, murder, what we'd do is we'd go along to the prison, into the cell, and for the defendant there, we'd have a, a little talk about the case. And what he'd do is he'd throw the brief onto the bench and he'd say, now, I want you to presume that I know nothing at all about this case. Tell me all about it from your point of view. And in fact, he knew nothing about the case. He'd not read the papers. <laughs> he'd not looked at it. That was his way of finding out about it. But he picked up, he picked up all the detail and he was wonderful. And of course, the greatest case that he did for me was the Donald Nielsen, the case involving uh, the, uh, the Black Panther. 
uh, a dreadful succession of cases there, three or four postmasters who were murdered. Leslie Whittle, who was uh, uh, kidnapped uh, and who was murdered. Uh, and uh, we had to deal with that case. And we had to deal with that case in a, an unfortunate way. What happened was that I was called to deal with that case for uh, Donald Nielsen uh, one day. And the reason I was called to defend him was that he had in his attic, where he kept all his guns and all his papers, he had there a file of papers of cases that I'd been involved in, all the cutouts. And he decided that I should defend him if ever he was convicted, if ever he was to go before the court. And that's how I got to deal with his case. Now, Gilbert handled his case masterfully. Everybody, no matter how wicked they are, no matter how dreadful the evidence against them may be, is still entitled to a defense. Uh, people often ask me, you know, how on earth can you defend people who are, in fact, uh, guilty as hell? And my answer is, I don't decide whether they're guilty uh, at all. It's not my business to decide whether they're guilty. I have to present their case. I have to ask if there are any holes in the prosecution case. I have to ask point by point, very carefully, what the evidence is all about. That's, that's the task of a, a defence counsel. And that is how we conducted the Donald Nielsen case. We did it by examining the prosecution's case, looking at it and putting forward what we could. Uh, and of course, uh, after quite a lengthy case, Donald Nielsen was convicted. Uh, and he was convicted on the basis of, you are sentenced to life imprisonment and it will be a life imprisonment. You will only be released either by old age or by infirmity. The final day of that case, Donald Nielsen was 40 years of age. It was actually his birthday when he was sentenced to that life sentence. And Gilbert Gray and I at Oxford Crown Court have the task of going down to the cells as you always do in somebody who has been sentenced to a lengthy period of time. And you try and tap them on their shoulder and you say, well, we tried to do what we could. Sorry, we did our best, blah, blah, blah. In this particular case, Donald Nielsen, 40th birthday, life shall mean life. Gilbert Gray and I walk down. Gilbert goes up to him, taps him on the shoulder and says, well, Donald, never mind. Remember, life begins at 40. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's, let's, uh, it was a serious case. It was a nasty case. It was a horrid case, but he actually said that. He, he, he tried his best. And I have to tell you that of all the counts on the indictment against that man, uh, at least two or three of them uh, well, he was cleared of. But in the end, it didn't mean anything. I mean, he, he spent his time in prison and he lived uh, all his life in, in, in prison. Gilbert Gray, uh, Gilbert died sadly a few years ago. Um, he was a wonderful barrister, and uh, I, I always had great admiration for great, great uh, advocates. You also mentioned Harry Ogmore. Harry Ogmore was a wonderful advocate. Harry Ogmore, in fact, took over the prosecution of the Yorkshire Ripper because the original counsel dealing with that was the Attorney General, who was somebody who was not a very good advocate. And Harry Ognall stepped in and helped the Attorney General, conducted the prosecution, and the Yorkshire Ripper was convicted. And it was as a reward, largely, for having done so successfully, that, that he, in fact, was, um, uh, or, or was, was made a judge. He, 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 was, he was a great, great judge, a great admiration for him. Now, we have a question uh, from our audience at home. Uh, Deborah Perlman uh, wants to know, would you like to comment on the extent and impact of anti-Semitism in this country during the last century? I personally have been pretty fortunate in that I have personally hardly ever come across a situation of anti-Semitism. Of course, there has been an advance of anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism has always existed. It's existed from the very beginning. It's the first Jews that, that, that ever existed. There have been those who were against them. 
And one would have thought, you know, that with all that had happened, the many people who were killed and the many people who died, that it would have closed down a little bit and that there wouldn't have been so much anti-Semitism. But it has existed. And my feeling about it is that the only way of eradicating anti-Semitism is inevitably through education. It's uh, by education that they have to be, people have to be shown, people have to be taken to Vaj Hashem, people have to be taken to the museum uh, in, in Nottingham where the, the righteous uh, have their wonderful museum. Uh, it will exist and it's sad that it's existed and it can only be cleared by forms of, of, of uh, education. I say again, I only came across one example. There was a little bit when I was in the army, there was a little bit when I was at school in 1947. And in 1947, following the occasions when there was anti-Semitism happening in all parts of the country due to the soldiers who were being killed in, in, in uh, the then Palestine through the terrorists, that caused anti-Semitism quite unnaturally. It, it um, didn't occur to me when I was a barrister. It occurred to me once, only once, when I was a judge. And what happened was this. I uh, was at Snaresbrook Crown Court, a great palais de justice, which had lots and lots of courts there. And there was one head judge there who was not a very nice person. I didn't think he was a not very nice person. I got on very well with him. And he liked me and I liked him. And he always insisted that I sat at the long table near him during the lunch period. But on one occasion, on one occasion, he started talking to me about his early day uh, as, a, as a barrister. He said, what, what I did was um, licensing work. Uh, I, I took any licensing work that I could get. Uh, what I did was when people wanted to start up a license, then we in fact uh, objected to them setting up their license. Uh, and we did with alco alcoholic, uh, alcoholic applications. But there was one man, one particular man who in fact uh, appeared and he was a rather awful little Jew, horrible little man, awful man, didn't like him at all, unprepossessing little character. Oh, who was that I asked? Oh, he was called Jack Cohen and he was setting up an organization which he called something like Tesco mm -hmm. and he was trying to prevent people opening up their licenses and other I said, Awful man. So I was taken aback. I, I, I didn't follow through on that at all. And I went back to my room and I rang up the uh, I rang up the uh, uh, people. I said, "Look, I can't really carry on with somebody making observations like that. I, I don't really want to sit at Snaresbrook anymore. I'd like to be moved if I if I could." And uh, the Lord, uh, the people of the Lord Chancellor, said, "Come and see me. Tell me about this." You don't have to go through that again. You don't have to have anything to do with that particular judge. We move you to another court. And they moved me to Harrow Crown Court, uh, which was a, a beautiful court. I didn't have to go back to uh, uh, the place where I'd been before. And so uh, there was an advantage. I, I, left that, I left that particular court and I went to the other court uh, where uh, I've already told you uh, uh, that the people were much more acceptable. Uh, and that was the benefit. I, I got away from it. Now, I didn't say anything nasty about this particular judge because he was due to retire very shortly afterwards. So I said, look, I'm, I'm not going to make an official complaint. But that was the only occasion that I had a problem with anybody during my lifetime. Well, Barrington, I could listen to you telling these tales for hours, but sadly, uh, we're out of time. Um, I can heartily recommend uh, Barrington Black's book. Uh, for those of you at home, if you'd like to buy a copy, uh, look out for the link on your follow-up email tomorrow. Um, if you're here uh, at the Leeds Library, uh, we have copies available and hopefully Barrington will, will have time to, to, to sign them for you. Yeah, if you like one here, but otherwise if you don't get one here, then you, you can get it, uh, I, I think, either from uh, uh, Amazon or somewhere like that. Yeah, I have something for you. This is uh, this is a book of some of my photographs of 
um, Magin David Adon, which is the Israeli ambulance service oh, uh, in, action, in, in, in Israel, which I hope you will, I hope you will enjoy. Thank you so much indeed. Pleasure. Thank you everybody for, for coming here today. Now, for our audience at home, uh, if you want to know about uh, future events uh, as part of Leeds Lit Fest, please visit leedslitfest.co.uk. The next Millim event is Menachem Kaiser next Monday, the 7th of March, where he will be at the UHC Leeds speaking about his book Plunder. Uh, join us in person or you can watch online either way please book at millim.org.uk you can find details of our future program there and also recordings of past events we also have uh, the acclaimed best-selling author howard jacobson in the next few weeks uh, so it remains for me to thank our uh, speaker barrington black uh, let's just give him a, a round of applause once again <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you all at a future event. Until then, stay safe. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.